all the volunteers, all the help, all the, all the staff members, the pastors, Hope Church, the congregation. You all have been a blessing to me. Um, I, I appreciate you hosting me this weekend. I appreciate all of you that um, put everything together six months ago when I was up here in December. And, um, and I'm looking forward to what God's doing in the house and what he's going to do. But to this morning, I want to talk to you guys about what he is doing. You see, we always try to cast this vision of what he's going to do. But you see, in this house, God's already doing it. It's already in motion. It's already in action. You see, I ask in December, your, your team, your, your staff members and your volunteers and your pastors, if they would... Join into this vision. What we're seeing in the body of Christ is people come to church and come and go and come and go. And then they don't really stay. And when we get to the root of why they don't really stay, it's because unless they experience a real touch from heaven, then there's nothing real or tangible to hold on to. And there's so many other things that are prying us away from God because they're more entertaining than coming to church. But I'm going to tell you that a touch from God, the presence of His Holy Spirit in the house, is far more entertaining than anything you're going to find at Disney World or anywhere else. Because one touch from heaven will change everything. I want to thank Pastor Ashley and Jay for having me up here. I have known these two for many years. And I said in first service, many years. And you guys may think that um, many years may be like three or four years. But when you're my age, many years is a lot. <laughs> so I've actually been knowing Jay and Ashley through ministry, other churches, you know, opportunities and things that we've been involved in um, for probably, what, 10, 11 years, I would say, maybe even longer. So when I say many years, I mean many years, and these two are truly a couple, truly a godly example of what a marriage should look like. I know them, and I know that you can trust them. I know that in this house and maybe in many houses, religiously, things may look a little bit different than what we may be accustomed to in our customs and cultures. Um, but I want to say this, in this hour that we live in, I'm just thankful that somebody is preaching the gospel and lifting up the name of Jesus. And maybe even in myself, I'm able to set aside some of my religious ideas, my religious ideologies, and in order to clear the road for King Jesus to enter in. Right? So I just want to honor them because I understand the position that she's had to step into is not something she asked for. It was something that she was plunged into and she called me because she didn't know what to do about this. She's concerned just like anybody else is concerned. But as a woman of God, she's filled that position greatly. And I'm proud of her for what she's doing. Give her a hand. Of... Hope Church is a beacon of light to this region that you live in. Hope Church is forerunners in a ministry to bring Jesus Christ to this nation. I believe that your pastors and their team are praying people who have prayerfully thought through prayerfully strategize, prayerfully made decisions for this house in order to see it move forward um, in edification in this season that we live in. 
In this society that we live in, it's hard to have a house like this who their desire is to be all that the Word of God says that we can be in Christ. And I'm proud of them for that. Because in this hour, there's so many Christians that are compromising what they believe in order to satisfy what society says. I just want to applaud Hope Church for everything that y'all are. I want to applaud y'all for who you are in Christ Jesus. Six months ago, I cast vision into this church for direction that I believe that God was leading you. I cast that vision and I gave a challenge to the team and a challenge to the congregation. And I made a deal with you and I said, if you will fulfill your responsibilities and that you would host the presence of God in your church, that then I would keep my end of the deal and in six months I would come back up here and I would breathe more into this vision for us to move forward as, as we take Hope Church into what God has for it. You guys have been having this move of God that we're talking about. where It's not something that God is bringing to Hope Church. It's something that God has already begun in Hope Church. And six months ago, you guys, through your efforts and your prayers, have, have begun that journey already. And we've seen many salvations and we've seen many deliverances, many people filled with the Holy Spirit. And we've seen a transformation in the body of Christ and you guys coming into a place of edification and, and building up the saints. Because you are the gospel. You're carrying that fire. You're carrying that gospel to the nation. Back then, in December, the Lord gave me a word for Hope Church for painted post being planted in Hope Church. And if you guys were there on that evening, it was on a Wednesday night. This is what the Lord said. He said that Hope Church is planted in a town called Painted Post. He said, you tell Hope Church that 2,000 years ago, I had a painted post and it was placed on the hill of Calvary. And it was painted with the blood of my son, Jesus Christ. He said, 2,000 years ago, the blood of Jesus had the power to save. And 2,000 years later, it still has the power to save. The blood of Jesus is the answer. It's the answer for where we are. It's the answer for the season that we're in. So now we move six months forward and now we're in June. Great things happening, right? Great things, exciting things happening in Hope Church over the past six months. Great things and great increase are still to come. We're only moving from glory to glory. We're only moving from one good thing to another good thing. You know what? We're doing what God's called us to do and we're taking this journey so that we can take this gospel to the nation. We have to be careful that there are not things to stumble upon along the way. The first century church stumbled upon little things along the way. And, and, and those things had to be corrected and moved out of the way so that we could have the gospel today. So as we stumble our way along, I would ask that we try to put pettiness aside and we keep our eyes on the prize. We keep our eyes on Jesus and we move forward with what he's got for his church. As I was preparing to come up here, the Lord took me back to that word about the painted post. So I started researching Painted Post to find out what, it, what is that about? What is that? Wh where did that come from? Um, and we don't really know. Like the history books aren't really clear. Some people feel like um, some early settlers put that post there. Um, some people say that uh, Native Americans planted that post there. Um, there's a lot of history that goes around it and a lot of uh, speculation on who exactly was involved in, in naming this town painted post 
But in my research, I came across something and I felt the Lord on it. And it's the word that I want to release to your church in this hour. This is what I believe. I believe that you're strategically placed in a region. Uh, this region, this Pennsylvania, New York region, is a foundational region of our country. It is a, it is a seat that's been established from the beginning of our existence as America. These are our formidable years of, of a country, our first years of a country, and where you're at here is, is very important to reaching the rest of the country. This is where it began, and, and, and I believe there's a heavy weight that is placed on your region to be a place of a light to shine out to the rest of the world. And this is what I find out about planted, planted or painted post, is it's planted at the convergence of three rivers. The Lord said, my throne is also planted in the convergence of three rivers. And those rivers are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And just like... On earth as it is in heaven, I believe that the convergence of the three rivers here is symbolic of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And I believe out of painted post, out of this region, out of this house, that there'll come a prophetic voice that will travel through those rivers and out to our country and will bring deliverance and healing and power in the name of Jesus to this nation. I believe that you have been placed here for a season such as this. I'm going to talk this morning about what's called a remnant of people. A tenth, a portion, a, a remnant of God's people. I'm going to read very fast, so keep up. We're starting in 1 Kings 18 and verse 20. And believe it or not, a hick from Polk County, if he's got his reading glasses on, can actually read pretty fast. So I'm going to go after it here. I may paraphrase. Um, I'm reading out of New King James, and I may paraphrase um, just for the sake of time because we have a lot to cover and I want the Word of God to be read because I believe that the Word of God is the answer for our world. <clears throat> so Ahab sent forth all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal, follow Him. But the people answered not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left the prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bowls. Let them choose one bowl for themselves, cut it into pieces, and lay it on the wood. But put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other bowl and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, <clears throat> let, or he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bowl for yourselves and prepare it. First, for you are many, and call on the name of the God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them, and they prepared it. And they called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice and no answer. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is God. Either he is meditating or he is busy or he is on a journey or perhaps he is sleeping so they cried aloud and cut themselves as was their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out of them and when midday had passed they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice but there was no voice no one answered no one paid attention then Elijah said to all the people come near me so all the people came near and said to him, 
or came near to him. And he prepared the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two seahs of seed, and put the wood in and put the wood in order, and he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, Fill four water pots of water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, Do it a second time, and they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time, and they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar, and he and he also filled the trench with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me that the people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifices and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench now when all the people saw it they fell on their faces and they said the Lord he is God the Lord he is God and Elijah said to them seize the prophets of Baal do not let one of them escape so they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there We are in a season in this country where we have failed to recognize that the blessings that we live in are the blessings that come from Jehovah God. We live in a season where we believe that we have done this on our own. We've gotten conceited in our own prideful self and we feel that we don't need God. And we feel that we're able to bow our knees to things of our society and we're allowed to compromise the things of this word of God in order to have what we want and to have the blessings that God has given us. Israel was in the same position. Israel was in the same place. And my word to you this morning and my question to you this morning is, how long will you halt between two opinions? How long will you falter between two opinions? How long will you stumble on this question between two opinions. Either Jehovah is God or Baal is God. But today I ask you, who will you serve? As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. In December, I talked to you about the division that I'm seeing in the body of Christ. I'm seeing that For five years, I've been speaking about this division in the body, this separation in the body where, let's say back in the 80s, we could all go to church and we could all pretty much look alike and we kind of blend in and we can kind of kind of fill into the gray areas and we didn't really have to be one or these or one or the other. We all just were Christians, right? And Christians all looked the same and acted the same and dressed the same. Pretty much we were just we just labeled ourselves, right? Maybe just me. (laughs) Probably some of y'all wasn't even around in the 80s, right? (laughs) So um, about five years ago, the Lord showed me in a vision of the church beginning to split or beginning to part ways. And what he said is, there's going to be a world church and there's going to be my church 
There's going to be the world system of doing Christianity. And there's going to be my remnant people. And I'm going to begin to make this division or this chasm is what he called it. I'm going to make it wider and wider and wider. He said, and it's going to get to a point to where you're not going to be able to invite them to an altar for them to be saved in the way that you used to be able to do it. Because I'm going to start to turn them over to their reprobate mind. I'm going to begin to turn them over to a way of thinking that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. I'm going to begin to turn them over to a Jesus that has no power. I'm going to begin to turn them over to a church system that they'll believe is the truth, and it will be a compromised church system, and I'm going to keep a remnant for myself for my glory. Over the past five years, I've watched this get wider and wider and wider and wider. And I say, Lord, what are we going to do? Lord, what are we going to do? Lord, what are we going to do? And he says, this is what we're going to do. You must see that the churches host the presence of God. You must see that the Holy Spirit of God, that my Holy Spirit rests and dwells in that tabernacle rest in the wells in that church because the only way that you're going to reach them once I've turned them over to their reprobate mind is going to be by the power of my Holy Spirit my Holy Spirit will prompt them and pull them and guide them and direct them and if they'll respond to it if they'll go after me if they'll seek me then I'll save them and I'll heal them but your words won't convince them anymore Your words, your, your ear-tickling words won't convince them to salvation. So now five years later, we stand in a season in this country and globally to where I can't go and I can't just say under my own unction, Jesus Christ saves, Jesus loves you. Uh, let me talk to you about salvation. People will reject me. People will reject you. But if you will get in the Spirit, if you will carry the Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Ghost on you, then I am full well convinced that under the power and unction of the Holy Ghost, that I could stand up here on this stage and I could say, oh, McDonald, he had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, and if there's anybody that needs to be saved in this house, get down in this altar and I can with faith know that I can fill this altar with saved souls because it's not about me. Because it's not about what I can say. It's not about me convincing you. It's not about me having a neat sermon. It's not about me writing all my three-point messages. It's about the power of the Holy Ghost. It's about the anointing. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 6. I'm going to do that redneck reading again. That's rough stuff, isn't it? <laughs> In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Mm. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand on a live, having his hand on a live coal. Listen to me, people. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand on a live coal. Whew. Somebody's got to get this in their spirit. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand. A live coal, which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. 
And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. Mm. But here we go. It's going to get rough. You ready? And he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the hearts of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he said, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, the houses are without a man. The land is utterly desolate. Say houses without a man. Mm, Houses without a man. The Lord has removed men far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet a tenth. Will be in it. And will return and be for consuming. As a terabith tree or as an oak. Whose stump remains when it is cut down. So the holy seed shall be its stump. There is an attack. On this country. On this world. And we try to. Understand it. But here's the problem. Is the people who are explaining it to us. Are explaining it to us through eyes that don't see. And ears that don't hear. They're explaining it to us. With man's wisdom. And not the wisdom of the Holy Spirit living inside us. You see this attack that's come against us. Is an attack that's been against us. From the beginning of time. You see there's an enemy. That we're warring against. And this enemy hates your family. This enemy hates the union between a husband and a wife. This enemy wants to tear apart anything that's holy and anything that stands up and appears to be like the union between us and the Father. And this enemy will remove the man out of the house, will emasculate his position, will take away his position from the home. And I'm, this isn't a bigotist sermon that I'm talking about what I'm talking about is the way that God created us to live the enemy is against the family and he knows he can destroy it if he takes the head of the family out of the equation and y'all can fill in the blanks I'm just telling you where the attack's coming from and why the attack is what it is but But, you see, the men were removed from the home, right? The houses were without a man. So the land is utterly desolate. But, there was a tenth that was reserved. There was a holy remnant that was reserved. And the word says it's like a stump of an oak tree that had been cut down. Y'all ever cut down... A tree in your yard? She wanted it gone? What happens when the rain starts raining down on that tree stump that you left in the yard? What if you don't get that stump out of your yard and the rain starts raining down on that tree stump? What, what begins to happen? Little, little sprouts Little life starts coming back to that tree. Little sprouts start coming back up. That tree will grow up. And as a matter of fact, that tree will grow up to be a greater tree than the tree that was originally there. Because new life is coming to that tree. I'm telling you, it may look like you've been cut down. It may look like you've been removed. But God's beginning to pour out a rain on what you thought was dead. And He's about to resurrect it into new life. I'm telling you that... That there's always a remnant and there's always a a, a portion that is reserved for God's glory in the hour, always. And I believe that the churches who are preaching this message 
are the churches who are the remnant body of Christ who are going to bring forth the glory of God because they haven't bowed their knees to Baal, that they stand in a place where they say, it doesn't matter what this world says about me and it doesn't matter what they do about it. It doesn't matter what they take it away because the, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. There's a holy remnant. And I believe that Hope Church represents that holy remnant. And I believe that God's beginning to pour out the rain of his Holy Spirit upon that stump that you thought had been cut down and is dead. I already see new life coming. I already see the sprout sprouting up. Hey, it's springtime and the leaves are coming up out of that stump. Hey, there's new life coming up where you thought it was dead. I'm telling you that the Lord's doing something. I'm saying the Hope Church, six months from now, there'll be an increase like you've never seen before. Look, I'm telling you right now, that what you think is destroying your church and tearing it down will become pettiness and nothingness. I'm telling you that when you look in the rear view at where you came from, you're going to say it was only a distraction from what God was trying to take us into. You better start making plans of building an addition to this facility. Just saying. When the world's agenda has finally invaded every church in America and every school in America, they're going to come running to your door because there's always that remnant of people, of God's people, who when their eyes are open and their ears come open and they begin to perceive what's happening around them, maybe they're a little dull in spirit right now. Maybe they're not seeing it. Maybe they're not hearing it. And it's not your place to try to convince them. It's only the Holy Spirit's place to convince them. But what will happen is when their eyes and ears open, open and they realize that they are in error in the direction that they've been going they'll have an opportunity to run into the house of God and they're going to come looking for you and they're going to be standing on your front doorstep waiting for the doors to be open because this is what they want they're done with church America is done with church. America is done with the programs and the agendas and the, and the preachers and the singers. And the, the, America's done with it. What America wants is somebody bringing forth the word of God with a prophetic power and the Holy Ghost and a tangible touch from heaven. And that will save them. I don't want to borrow from somebody else, but I'll tell you who I borrowed it from. So that way, if there's any copyright infringement or whatever, whatever. Um, just for legal purposes, let's say that I am um, ordained through the uh, United Methodist Church. That way, they'll, they'll get blamed for it. No, I'm kidding. I'm not ordained through the United Methodist Church. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to say it then. I'm trying, Ashley. <laughs> There's some things you just can't say anymore. I need y'all to hear with your spiritual ears. I need you to see with your spiritual eyes. Because sometimes when I say things, it's unfortunate that the hour that we live in and Jesus was living in the same hour. If you remember, he always preached in parables and he did it in such a way that the Pharisees could not hear and see what he was saying and doing. He was flying under the radar, but if the Spirit of God would give translation to what was being said, then it would edify the people who were listening. So I need you to hear me in the Spirit and not hear me in the flesh because I'm going to lay down some things that I need you to pick up. Okay? <clears throat> 
there are people in the room, people in our homes, people in our country, people across America and people in the world that are bound and struggling with an attack, a bondage um, in their lives. And those bondages and those attacks are from Satan, right? And they don't understand why they stay in that place of bondage and attack because they don't understand how, how the authority works. If I came over to your house and your front door was unlocked, I still wouldn't have the authority to walk through your front door and sit on your couch, right? Can't do it because I don't have permission. So that means that if you um, catch me sitting there eating your potato chips and watching TV, when you come home from the store, I, like I'm in trouble. Like you're going to call the authority and you're going to be like, yo, dude is eating my potato chips and sitting on my couch. And I didn't invite him in. <clears throat> There were some people, all of us, I tried to be polite, but I'll just be real. All of us, we struggle with things in our life because we don't understand that we gave permission for them to be there. We say and we do things that we shouldn't say and do. We operate in negativity and we operate. Look, faith is the substance. It's the, it's the monetary stuff. Faith is the currency of the spiritual realm we are allowed to spend it on whatever we want to spend it on so i can use my faith and spend it on satan if i want to and you're like man that dude he spends his faith on satan i do all the time i have faith in satan you guys do too because what you do is you say Oh, I'm never going to be able to stop doing that. Or I'm never going to be able to overcome that. Or there's no way I'll ever pass that test. Or there's no way I'll ever be able to. There's no, I can't do, I can't. And when you're speaking negative against the things that God has blessed, then you're working in the currency of the darkness, of Satan. You're, you're giving foothold to him. And when you give him foothold, when you spend your currency with him, then he has permission in your life. You ever wonder why the things that you complain about are the things that just keep on happening? It's because you place your faith in Satan. Just being real, I do too. I complain about things that I shouldn't complain about and then I wonder why they keep happening to me. It's because I'm giving authority in that area. Okay, since we know that, little police lady steps out in the middle of the road, right? Right? I'm going to use this analogy. This analogy was by Kenneth Hagin. Anybody like Kenneth E. Hagin? I love Kenneth Hagin. Little police lady stands out in the road. She's got a uniform on and her badge and her pistol on the side. Semi-truck coming down the road and she puts her hand out and says, Stop! Semi-truck comes screeching to a halt and a foot before it hits her, it stops. It didn't stop because this 100-pound woman in this Uniform has the authority or has the strength to stop it. It stopped because the badge that she's wearing on her uniform gives her the authority and says there's a power higher than her that gives her the authority. And if the truck didn't stop, there's also power on her hip to stop it. So just the same, the blood of Jesus is the authority in your life that when the enemy sees the blood on you, it stops because it says he has the authority. She has the authority and there's a power higher than them that's going to stop me if I don't listen to them. And if he really needs it, if she really needs it, I see the pistol on their side. The Holy Ghost pistol is the power. So Jesus and his blood is the authority and the, and the Holy Ghost is the power. So if you accidentally invited bad things to happen to you, check this out. The angels were created for 
to serve you. Is that unbiblical? That's biblical, right? That's not heresy, is it? The angels were created to serve their heavenly hosts. They're created to serve God and his children, right? We're grafted into the body of Christ. We're uh, grafted into the kingdom, so we're children of God, right? So then the angels are servants to the children, right? Did you know that Satan was an angel? Did you know that his demons are fallen angels? Just by the way, I don't know why I need to say this, but the Holy Ghost just dropped in my spirit. If y'all are watching some of these uh, twilights and, and dark angels and these kind of things, I ask you to please stop that. In this house, we're not doing that. Amen? <laughs> Satan and his bunch are fallen angels. If you understand that seriously in the spirit, what you're saying is the very guy who's attacking you every week in your life and destroying things around you and, and he's stealing finances and he's stealing your joy and your peace and he's keeping you trapped in bondage. He can only do it if you give him permission. If you leave the front door unlocked, and he comes in without permission, he has to get out if you tell him to get out. Because the blood of Jesus is the authority and the badge that you're wearing that says, I have an authority and I have a higher power that's bigger than me that says, get out of my life. And if you don't get out of the life, I also got the Holy Ghost whose power, and you know what the Holy Ghost is called? is dunamis power. Dunamis power is the word that we get the, the word dynamite from. You literally got dynamite living inside of you. So you say, look, if you don't trust the blood of Jesus and its authority when I tell you to get out, that I'm fixing to put some dynamite on you. Come on. Amen. Right? I'm saying that because somebody here has been dealing with bondage in their life for so long and they're like, I'm a Christian and I go to the altar every Sunday and I want deliverance from this and I never get any victory over it and I don't know why I keep losing this battle and I think it's just simply a mindset where you have, unfortunately, somebody didn't tell you that information. You don't have to do what the devil tells you to do. You have authority over him. You tell him to leave me alone. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. And I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me. You don't belong here. If you want to torment me, do it from over there. Don't come up here in my face. Amen. I don't know how we got so far off track. But here's what I know. Is that God's word never returns void. Here's what I know is that. Like I said. Old MacDonald had a farm EIEIO. The Holy Spirit's already working on your hearts. It's got nothing to do with me. John the Baptist, out in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. He's baptizing for repentance. Baptizing in water for repentance. And um, the Pharisees come out there. They want to be baptized too. He said, who invited you out here, you brood of vipers? Who told you to come out here and repent? But Matthew goes on to say this. John the Baptist said, there's one coming who's greater than I. Whose sandals, I'm not, even, I'm not even worthy to carry them, right? He said, surely I baptize you with water for repentance. But this one, this Jesus Christ, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. This Jesus that I'm talking about, this Jesus that we saw this morning changing lives, that Jesus that, look, once I was lost, but now I'm found. Yeah. Holy Ghost and fire, brother.
I'm full well convinced in my life and in your life that there's nothing greater than a life that surrendered to serving the Lord. I believe that everything else comes second place, third place, fourth place, but nothing comes first place above Jesus Christ. I believe that some of us are holding on to things in our life that are stopping us from fully surrendering and moving into that thing that God has for us. I believe that we've bowed our knees to a bail in our own lives and we've surrendered what God has for us. We've traded what God has for us for what we think is best for us. I may have shared this with y'all before. I want to do a little exercise. Or I just want to talk about something real quick. So, um, if you drink too much water, do you know what will happen to you? You'll die. Water is good for you, though. I don't drink much of it at all. Only water I drink is the ones they give me, but other than that, it's Coca-Cola. <laughs> but um, if I drink too much water, I'll die, right? What if I breathe too much air? I'll die. If I breathe too much air, I'll probably die too, right? How about if, um, whatever, if I eat too much food, it's nourishment. If I eat too much food, I'll die, right? So pretty much everything that seems good, if I have too much of it, then I can die, right? Man, I'm here to tell you this morning that some of you have been indulging in things that seem good, but it's leading you to a place of death. It's killing you. It's killing you spiritually. It's killing you physically. But let me tell you something. I know somebody and I know something that the more you get, the more you get is life. I know that Jesus Christ is the only thing that I can go after with everything that I got, that I can go after him. I can overdose on him. And if I get too much of him, I'm only going to have more life. The word says, he who hath the son hath life, but he who hath not the son of God hath not life. Jesus is the answer. And Jesus is life. Everything else is death. Everything else is tragedy. But Jesus. Man. Ashley. Hope Church. God is moving you into a new season. God is moving you to a place to reach lives. And always, always, always are there three people sitting in the congregation. Always, always, always in every house there's three people. When I say that, I mean three different types of people. Three different places that you could fit in. You could fit into into probably a couple of them, but... You're going to be fitting into one of three places. Either you're a fairly new Christian and you're still excited and full of zeal about God. Or you're a older seasoned Christian and you've come, become kind of complacent and a little bit dry and, and you're just kind of like fruit that's been on the vine too long. Then you've got these other people. And... They're sitting there and they're like, but in me, I feel like I'm so fired up and excited about what the word of God has to say and what the future is for us. And like this whole going to heaven and, and this whole be, being saved and this whole. And, and, but, but the problem is, is when I look to my right and I look to my left, I see nobody else seems to be sharing in the same thing. Nobody. And if I were to express how I felt inside, then I'd be the weirdo in the room. And then nobody would want to sit next to me. And then at lunch, they'd all be talking about me. And, and, but here's what I know. 
Here's what I know, is every one of you have been touched by Jesus if you're saved. So that means at one point in your life, every one of you was that person. But here's the thing, is there's some of you that continue to press in and press in and press in and get filled and filled and filled with the oil of God. And you're, and you're filled with God's spirit and his oil. And I'm here to tell you that I'm ready to set that oil on fire. I want to say something this morning. I want the words coming out of me and the words coming out of this Bible to prompt something inside of you that sparks that oil on fire that you might get the ones next to you that are that are dry and, and, and barren that they would begin to be on fire for God and that that new Christian would say, well, this is what I got into Christianity for because it looks like everybody's excited for God because I'm telling you, unless the Spirit of God will move you, you're not moving anywhere. You must have the Spirit of God moving on your life. You must be filled with that oil. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for this church. Pastor Ashley and Jay, are so dedicated to you guys. I've known them for a long time. And I go and I speak in a lot of churches. And I'm not saying anything bad about other people. What I'm saying is sometimes you find people who aren't genuinely in love with the sheep. I don't care what religion tells me about all of that. What I do know is that you have a shepherd that truly loves these sheep. That truly is for you. This is not her house. This is not her ministry. This is your house. This is your ministry. This is the congregation, the sheep of this house. She's just here to help you. She's just here to help instruct and guide and, and move the flock along as they're going where they're going. And I'm here to tell you that you're going great places. I'm here to tell you that you are a city set upon a hill. I'm here to tell you that the power of God is in this house and the saving grace of Jesus Christ fills the room. I'm, I'm here to encourage you. Let's go. Let's go win a nation. Let's go win a world for Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you, I've already tested the spirits in the house. And your pastors love you. Your team loves you. When I came in December, I didn't know anything about you guys. I typically ask that I don't know anything because I really want to give a full prophetic word to the house that God has given to me without knowing anything about anybody. Ashley and Jay haven't had to tell me anything about you guys. God has revealed some things to me. And this is what he's saying. There's no condemnation and shame in Christ Jesus. Things happen. Things are out of our control sometimes. And hurt happens. Listen, I'm telling you what God's saying. Please don't chastise them for it. Because they didn't share this with me. I want healing in this house. God wants healing in this house. And when his children bicker with each other, come on. Look, we all get hurt and offended. I can't fix hurt and offense. But I do know that it breaks God's heart when he's got such a plan and a purpose and an anointing on a group of his children and they get sidetracked in some petty stuff that really doesn't matter. I don't know what that means to you guys. I'm only telling you as the Spirit gives me utterance. But whatever this petty thing is, I don't know if it's got to do with the 
with the movies and stuff that I mentioned earlier. I don't know what it is and I don't even want to know. But whatever it is, what's ever caused the offense and the hurt, God needs you to get past it. Because there's souls outside that door that have got to be saved. There are souls in this world that are lost and if we can't reach them, they're going to hell. There's souls in this house right now that if we can't let go of our petty stuff and really press into what God has for the house, we're going to lose them to the enemy. Eternity in hell. looking across you guys and I want you all to be everything that God has for you and when I look and I think that any one of you may not make it into the kingdom of heaven that breaks my heart I'm sorry if what I just shared right there came across in any way other than love I don't know what it means to you guys I don't I don't live here I don't know y'all's history I, I don't know anything about anything but what I do know is that God has a plan and a purpose for this church I am ready to see souls saved in this house and if we can move forward into the future, if we move forward into what God's calling us to, I'm telling you that God's going to pour out something. He's already begun the work. We already see the evidence of it. We're already seeing souls saved. We're already seeing people being baptized into the kingdom. We're already seeing it. And He's going to continue it in a greater portion. proportion. This is what He finished it up with after He told me that. This is what He finished it up with. He said that what he's pouring out on this house will be so great until you won't worry about what offenses happened in the past. It'll be so great that you'll be filled with joy that you're a part of it. You'll be filled with joy even to this even to this extent i'm going to even say it to this extent maybe there's some people who have been hurt to the point where they feel like i can't be a part of this house any longer don't leave because god's just about to do what he's going to do he's already begun there's already evidence of it and don't miss out don't be over there I've, I've lived it myself and maybe it's only coming out of my own heart from my own experience i've left churches that I've gotten offended with and then only to look back to see what God does through those people and then a jealousy a holy jealousy of, of I wish that I was there and I was a part of that but I can't go back now because maybe I showed my backside right I'm not invited back into the house because I didn't act right when I left I'm only being transparent for you guys so that you understand you don't want to be on the sideline. You don't want to be sitting outside of the game. The very thing that drives y'all is that you're going to get put in the game. Look, I'm, I'm going to speak to you because I hear it. You say, God, if you're really God. God, if you really have something for me. You ready? This is for somebody. This is for many people. Then why have you set me on the sideline? Why have I spent so many years sitting on the sideline? If you've called me to something, then why can't I be in the game? Why can't I be a part of what's going on? Why can't I be a, a part of the excitement? Why can't I be in there? Why, or there's some of you that are like, I feel that I'm called into full-time ministry. I feel that I've been called to be a preacher. I feel that I've been called to be a missionary. But the doors just haven't opened. And it feels like I'm sitting on the sideline. And I feel like that piece of fruit that's been hanging on the vine year after year, season after season. And God, you never came and picked me. Man, this is heavy right here. You picked a lot of people around me, but you didn't pick me. Some of you even said, how is it that certain people around the country that I see in these scandals in the churches got to be a pastor, but I love you, God, and you didn't let me, you didn't pick me. The 
this is what he's saying. It's because I have a holy tenth. It's because I have a holy remnant that's consecrated to me. It's because I've listened to every prayer that you've prayed in silence. Every prayer that you've prayed in your secret place. Every tear that has fallen from your eye because of your desire to serve me. Because of your desire to be a minister for me. And I have withheld you from that so you wouldn't be mixed up in the middle of anything scandalous they would take you out of the game I have withheld you for a season and a purpose because I am God and I always have my holy tenth consecrated to me I'm telling you you're a remnant I'm telling you God's doing something special for you and he has withheld you for himself come on come on prayer team prayer team if you come up here the word has gone forth you know why I have faith Because I can trust the one who's faithful. Man. If you heard my story, you'd say, man, that guy's life just is tragic every time he turns around. Like bad things happen to that dude. Like he's got a terrible life. Like every time he turns around, he's getting knocked in the head. You should have heard the tragedies in my home and around me just to get up here this weekend. But if you look at it through those glasses, you see it as tragedy follows this guy everywhere he goes, everywhere he steps, bad things are happening. But when you see it through God's eyes, this is what I know, that my God is faithful, that he'll never fail me and he's never let me down. It may look dark, and it may look bleak in the middle of the storm, but Jesus will always come through. And in the end, He gets the glory. Because I see it different. Because I see it that there's anointing on me and the enemy is going to stop me from doing what I'm going to do. But you know what? That attack only brings more glory to Jesus. It only brings more glory to him. Because out of that pain and out of that hurt, I can come to you and I can say your pain and your hurt and your loss and your brokenness. It isn't tragedy. It's God's hand on your life saying I'm going to form and mold and shape these people so that they have a little grit under their belt. Oh, how many in the room are sick and tired of hearing preachers that ain't got no grit under their belt? You're saying, man, you've lived such a cushy little life. You don't even know what it feels like to be addicted to drugs and alcohol. You don't know what it feels like for pornography to haunt you every day. You don't know what it feels like to live in this world because you lived under the shelter of the ministry your whole life. Well, but you're saying, why don't I have somebody who's got a little grit under their belt? God's calling you. Because you got grit under your belt. Because you've been through some garbage. Because you've been through some trash. And because he's cleaned you up in the process. And when you have these people come to you and say, I need somebody who knows what I'm going through. You say, sister, I've been there. Sister, I've lost. Sister, I, I, brother, I know what it feels like to not have what I thought I should get. I know what brokenness feels like. And I know, I know what it feels like to see people in the altar saved, set free, delivered, and healed. And to sit at the bedside of my sister and watch COVID take hold of her life and pull it away from me. I know what pain feels like. I know 
what it feels like to want to come up here and be with you guys on vacation with my family and the enemy to put sickness on my little girl and spend three days laying hands and praying on her with a 105 degree temperature. I know what it feels like. I know what it feels like to barely have enough money to afford a brand new truck. And two hours before I'm supposed to get on an airplane, that brand new truck leaves me stranded in the middle of a parking lot and I thought I wasn't even gonna make it here. That's just last week. I know what it feels like to be addicted. I know what it feels like to be broken. I know what it feels like to be rejected, made fun of. I know what it feels like to not have friends and be lonely. I know what it feels like. I know what it feels like when they talk about me behind my back. I know what it feels like. I was born dead. I was born dead. And the doctors told my mom, you should just kill the baby. He'll never make it. I know what it feels like. And if I look through it, through those glasses, it looks like tragedy falls and follows me every step of the way. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup runneth over. I'm going to tell you, I've got an anointing on my life that I, I've seen miraculous things happen. I've seen healings happen. Man, I know the brokenness of being barren and not be able to have a baby. I know what it feels like to think that God is against me and why people can throw babies in the trash can and abort their unborn children. And me and my wife serve the Lord with every ounce of our being and he rejects us and doesn't allow us to have a child. I know what it feels like to be barren. I know what it feels like. Oh, but if you look through it through those glasses, I look like a reject that God doesn't care about. But then people will come to these meetings and they'll say, well, preacher, lay your hands on me that I could be imparted that you're anointing on me so that when I pray for people they be healed so that when I pray for people they be saved I want your anointing preacher I want you to impart your anointing on me and I say I'll pray for you but what I'm thinking in my head is you don't want what I got because what I got's gonna cost you everything. What I got's gonna cost you your family. What I got's gonna cost you your money. What I got's gonna cost you your happiness and your joy. But when you look through it through those glasses, you say it's not worth the price. But when I stand here and I know that there's souls out there that are lost and need to be saved, I say there's no money. There's no money that can be replaced of a soul that's entered into the kingdom of heaven. Because when you look through it through the glasses I look through it from I say but Jesus can get all the glory and all the honor and all the praise because he never let me down he's never left me and he's never forsaken me in my darkest of darkest valleys he's been with me he's lifted me up and he's comforted me when I'm broken he heals me when I'm lost he saves me and I'm telling you that that Jesus will save you if you will lay down the things of this world stop bending and need a bail and get to this altar right now and say, Jesus, I surrender it all. I don't care if it costs me everything. It's all worth it if you be the glory and you be the honor and to you be the praise, King Jesus. It's all to you. It's all to you, Jesus.